All right, and we're back once again with the show. It's Gerald Glassford coming right back at you here. Thank you so much for listening. And it's always a great time for me to talk pop culture when I also get to go and talk a little bit of another facet of the pop culture realm that I like to talk about from time to time. And if you see my waistline, you'll understand why. And that is cooking. And I'll tell you why, because whenever this man comes on the air, oh, I get hungry and hungrier. And, uh, you know, after I will finish talking to him, I'm going to go run out and go to the store right away and get me some food that ready to grill because it is summer. It is that time of the year to go ahead and put everything on the barbecue, all that great stuff and go ahead and, and get some great grilling ideas because this man right here, if you've not heard him before, he is definitely, definitely got a great show that you need to listen to. It is the Smoking Hot Confessions podcast. You got to check it out on Apple Podcasts and over at least probably 20, almost probably, and probably, you know what? It's as many as ours. I'm going to say over 30 different podcast outlets. You know what? If you've not checked out his awesome show on the barbecue scene, you're missing out. Also as well, you got to check out his awesome site with just truly delectable pictures that are up there of, oh, just trade, this, oh, those menus, those those items that you go ahead and put out there. And as far as for pictures, just truly amazing. And that is smokinghotconfessions.com. Plus, you get the deep insight on the barbecue scene also as well. Not only the food, but also the devices and the and the grills that you can go ahead and, and learn what to use, how to use it, and, and where to go from as far as the, the ideas. Not only a great recipes, but the whole barbecue scene as a whole. It is my good friend who's also a pop culture aficionado as well. He can put that on the grill. It is Ben Arno. What's going on, my friend? Wow, man. What an introduction. Thanks so much. <laughs> well, I've done so many for you now. I've got to go ahead and up the ante. So uh, it's just it basically what it does, it messes me up for the next time because it's all downhill from there. <laughs> At least it's not raining this time around. No, no, we're not competing with the uh, with the sound of the rain on the tin roof tonight, which is nice. No, no, it's just the sweltering heat here in Vegas of 115 degrees, but that's okay. Ne need Ooh. I digress? Yes. Actually, you know what? I don't need a grill right about now. I just throw it out on the sidewalk, put a nice little steak there, and there you go. It'll get, it'll get medium rare in no time. But it is the Smoking Hot Confessions podcast. You got to check it out today. Truly awesome show. Before we go ahead and have you elaborate in detail at the end of our interview in regards to Smoking Out Confessions, you got to talk to me about all the great stuff that you're doing and all the great stuff that's going on in your world when it comes to pop culture, because you know what? We're going to correlate some of the things in pop culture with some of the things you like to cook or you like to grill and see if they can go ahead and mesh together, because you know what? Pop culture and food... I think they do do. I think they go together. I think it's okay. I think it's okay. But first off, my friend, I know you got a chance a chance to check out Avengers Endgame. You were psyched for it down in Australia. You were just so so pumped and amped for it. Did it meet your expectations 3 hours later? Mate, I thought it was incredible. I I just loved that movie. Um I went and saw it with my wife and son cuz we're all into it. We all love it. And I think my wife was in tears at, at, at four different points during the film. It just kept hitting these beats and uh, it had sort of, it, it had really you know, cut you to the core and then build you back up again for the next scene. Um, and when you read through the roster of, of just how many people are, uh, are in that film, it was unbelievable that they managed to do them all justice in what comparatively little screen time they had. And, yeah, it, it was really cool. Um, some of the takeaways for me, I think I'm I'm a bit disappointed that uh, that Black Widow uh, died. Um, I'm I'm assuming it's two months ago that we that, that we watched the movie, so I can talk about things like that. Absolutely, um, spoiler away, my friend. If you've not seen it by now, and it is the number two movie of all time, you know what? Sorry. We're just going to go ahead and have to spoil it for you. But <laughs> Black Widow did perish in the movie. And as a consolation prize, she is getting her own movie next year. And I would not put out of the realm of possibility if she's cool with it and Marvel's cool with it to get her back in there. Because if they do an A-Force, which is the Avengers force comprised entirely of women, uh, superheroes in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, then 
I would think she would have to be a part of it and they'll have to think of some creative way out of it and uh, the, where, she, you know, what happened to her because they're probably trying to do the same thing in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. I'd say so. They're probably going to try and uh, g go back in time and save Gamora and, and in the process uh, save Black Widow as well because, as you say, she is getting her own um, standalone film and I'm psyched to... Uh, to see that because ever since Iron Man 2, she had that hallway fight scene in Iron Man 2. I've been just dying to see her get her own uh, movie. And as excited as I am about it, it's a prequel. And I really want to see where she goes from where we are now. I like just seeing her in the office, um, basically heading up the Avengers. You know, I thought that would have been a very interesting character arc for her and a real positive. Um, role model for the female characters in the in the universe there well i'll tell you what if they do not touch upon budapest after hyping it so much i think on three different occasions in the marvel cinematic universe then you know what that's wrong that's just wrong i think they've got I, I think they have to touch upon it as far as how crazy quote unquote budapest was uh, whatever happened there with hawkeye Bla black widow and all that so i think they should touch upon it and I, hopefully they'll also get Samuel L. Jackson's Nick Fury involved as well because he was a part of that whole scenario. So I'd love to see them get back to it. I'm not exactly disappointed that they're going back in time for it because I would love to see that part of her career because we've seen so much of her story arc now. Would I like to see her lead uh, you know, as far as uh, the Avengers once again, because she was the de facto leader of the Avengers for a good portion of the Marvel Avengers in game. Yes, I would love that. Love to see her back in the saddle once again. But I do want to see her backstory because they've alluded so much to it over the course of so many different Marvel Cinematic Universe films. I'd like to go ahead and see them touch upon it. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it would be very cool. And the the Budapest thing is going to be interesting because, you know, she and Hawkeye have been through, you know, aliens invading New York and all this sort of stuff. So, and they're, and they're talking about, oh, Budapest, Bud like, how does Budapest top, you know? Or how does Hawkeye? it even compare? Yeah. <laughs> so, like, what's the ante in that film, you know? Like, what's the, what are the stakes in that film? if they've already fought and won against aliens invading New York. So yeah, it, it's going to be interesting to see what they do. It is going to be interesting to see what they do as that will pros most likely be the first of the Marvel Cinematic Universe films to come out next year. Or then along you have the internals. And I want to ask you when it comes to the internals, Angelina Jolie obviously has been cast in the lead role and I mean, it creates some type of mystery as far as the internals because the general, Marvel Cinematic Universe fan does not have any clue on the Eternals. But then again, they didn't either for the Guardians of the Galaxy. But the Guardians of the Galaxy, it, the way the story was told and the narrative was created, it was very easy for people to get into because the nature of the Guardians of the Galaxy was so friendly and inviting and so comical. The Eternals doesn't seem like it's going to go down that same route, at least at this point in time. So if, if you're trying to get into what the Eternals is all about. I mean, that's the big question because Eternals for me is something that I know is going to be either a big hit or a big miss when it comes to the theaters next year. Yeah, it does sound like it's going to be a bit of a gamble. You know, you you got a race of immortals who lived on Earth and shaped its history. I mean, if they're that, if they're that big and that powerful, why have they just been sitting on the sidelines and watching and then how how do they stack up against someone like captain marvel exactly so uh, it's it, we're just I, I don't know it's just right now it's a wait and see because there is so much to detail when it comes to eternals and educate the audience on before the movie even comes out so you know that that's all wait and see but i'm so glad that you and your your wife and your your you know awesome family got a chance to go ahead and enjoy avengers and game and that it was everything that you were hoping for I believe as well for many people that it was that great experience to close off that part of the of the series. But then again, it really doesn't because Spider-Man Far From Home actually closes off this part of the Infinity Saga, which I thought was a mistake. Personally, I think Avengers Endgame should have been the Endgame. Am I wrong in saying that? 
No, I agree. It's um, I feel like they've really wrapped up the the end game saga now, and I'm kind of curious as to what sort of addendum Spider Man can put on there. I um, you know, th- there's a whole bunch of questions there. You know, it's it's five years later. Why are all Peter Parker's friends still in high school when he returns? And you know, that there's all those sorts of questions as well. Um, yeah, I I just. And again, it's the, it's the ante, it's the stakes. It's, you know, they've already played for keeps. They've lost Iron Man and then, uh, and um, Captain America is now a very senior citizen. So what what is there left for Spider-Man to add to that particular story? It's, it's going to be interesting. I had some friends go through high school for five years, but it wasn't due to a Thanos snap. No, I'm sorry. No. <laughs> Just bad grades. But we won't go there. We won't go there. I won't say who. I won't say who. Yeah. Shout out, shout out, shout out. But uh, I will say that there's a lot going on in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And it's always a great time when it comes up on television or you put it in as far as Blu-ray for that total experience. I want to ask you, Mr. Grilling Expert, and our aficionado when it comes to the pop culture cosmos and barbecuing and all that, what kind of menu item would you suggest and say, you know what? Hey, Ben, I want you to come over to the house. I'm running a whole marathon of Marvel Cinematic Universe greatness. I want you to go ahead and come up with a dish that you think best serves the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Ooh. Okay. I'm well, putting him well, on the spot, so to speak. I did not prep him on it for a reason. It was kind of intentional because, you know, what? this man comes up with the most delectable of meals, the most awesome of descriptions and I wanted to see if he could do it on the spot because he's just so talented like that. And again, I'm setting you up. I'm setting you up. <laughs> well, something that I love to do when I watch movies is grab a uh, like a big frozen Coke type drink, like a, a slushy or something. And uh, you can absolutely make them at home. So I'd, I'd have some of them. And because I'm making them at home, I'd, I'd, I can have, you know, some margarita flavored ones or something like that if I wanted to. And with an icy drink, you're going to want something nice and hot and spicy. So uh, you probably really couldn't go past um, some jalapeno poppers, I reckon, to sit there and uh, and eat some of those nice hot spicy things with uh, with a nice icy cold drink and sit there and uh, and make your way through some of those Marvel films. That would be pretty good. Oh, and some caramel popcorn too. Now you mentioned jalapeno peppers in the past, but you've also told us about how to best cook jalapeno peppers because those can be miscooked and those can be really flat tasting because i've gone to restaurants before and they've tried them and some of them can be done really poorly yeah it's um it's kind of funny it it comes down to uh to whether they've been grilled or smoked and also how um uh and also how well they've they've cleaned out the insides of those poppers. So if you just knock the seeds out but leave the white membrane inside the popper, it's still going to be really hot because the white membrane is where the heat is. If you scrape and scrape and scrape and scrape and scrape all the membrane out, then you're just left with like a we, – we, we'd call it a capsicum here. You'd call it a pepper there. So um, you want to make sure you leave a little bit of that white membrane in there so you still get a bit of that kick but not too much. And you want to make sure that you cook the peppers with a offset heat. So you're not direct grilling them because you want them to, you, you want that bacon wrap to, um, to, to darken and color and take on the, the smoke and the charcoal. And you also want it to, well, f- for me anyway, I like to do it to cook it for a really long time. So the bacon gets as crunchy as possible. Cause I like my bacon crunchy. So for me, that's what I like because inside you've got the soft pepper and the soft cream cheese. So that, that crunchiness of the bacon on the outside just really sort of offsets that in terms of texture when you bite into it. Um, so yeah, a nice big tray of peppers of, of jalapeno poppers. And, uh, Oh, one tip I will give is to get hold of some meat church, honey hog. It's a spice rub I've been playing with a bit recently and, um, it, it's actually got granulated honey in there as well. So, after you've you've opened up your peppers, scraped the seeds out, left some of the membrane in, mixed up some cream cheese, let that get to room temperature, crush it up with uh, some dried 
powdered garlic and onion. Stir that all up. Put that into the pepper. Wrap it in bacon. Put a toothpick through it. Smoke it for, I like to give it a long time, as I said, like two or three hours um, at a low temperature, about 225, 250. And uh, before you put them in the smoker, grab some of that meat church honey hog with the uh, with the granulated honey in it. Sprinkle that across the top of the bacon. Turn them over so you get it on both sides. And you're going to get a real nice, uh, sweet honey flavor come through just on top of that, which is going to be, that's phenomenal. That's oh. good stuff. It's good. It's good unless you're eating it and you don't have that frozen Coke near you or the frozen margarita in here. Then you're going to be like, ah, ah, ah. but I'll tell you what, I want to ask you one last thing when it comes to cooking with the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And again, I'm with Ben Arnaud from the Smoking Hot Confessions podcast. You know what? You forgot to mention shawarma. You got to have shawarma ah. as far as with the Avengers movies, of course. And with shawarma, I mean... I've seen it, uh, you know, I've been to places, actually my my daughter, she was, my, my oldest daughter, she was so crazy for shawarma as far as after watching the Avengers because of that final scene as far as that's concerned. And, you know, she goes, oh, let's go to shawarma, let's try a shawarma. So we tried it and whatnot, but it was all right. But I know it can be cooked better. And I know it was probably the issue with the cooking as far as the way it was grilled. So when you're cooking shawarma or lamb or anything of that nature that you want to go ahead and put in a gyro or shawarma type format, I mean, how best is it to approach? Because I, I have a sense it's for when I try it and I eat a lot of gyros from time to time because I love Greek food, I, I either taste really juicy and really good or really has a tendency to be dried out and, and flavorless. And that to me is kind of disappointing when that happens. Yeah. Yeah, that, that can happen. And a lot of that comes down to how long the meat has been sitting there before it's been put into the uh, into the wrap for you. Um, what you want to do when you're looking at a place or if you're looking at, at doing it yourself is to cut it fresh and uh, and not go to a place that's had it just sitting there for a while because it, it will dry out really quickly because they do cut it quite thin. Um, so yeah, that that would be my advice. There would be to make sure that you cut it fresh off the uh, off the rotisserie. Oh, that sounds good. But do you have any other swarm ideas for you? What do you what do you actually put on as far as yourself when it comes to or the tzatziki sauce? Or because we've talked about this before on some of your uh, some of our more recent conversations as far as you know creating that type of shawarma euro type experience. Well, if you're making them yourself, then you've really got the uh, the doors wide open in terms of creativity. So, the the shawarma is based on a on a doner kebab. Um, traditionally, it's made of lamb or mutton, and again, that that can be a problem because mutton is a lot tougher than than lamb, which would be one of the reasons why they cut it or shave it so thinly. Which, if it then sits for a while, then it dries out and it gets tough again anyway. So, um, if you are making it with something like uh, chicken or turkey or beef, you can add different flavors to that to suit the time of year. So if you wanted to have turkey shawarma for Thanksgiving, you could, um, instead of like a thick sauce, you could add a little bit of stuffing and gravy or, you know, some uh, like a cranberry sauce instead of, instead of a tzatziki, something like that. So you could have a bit of a look at the time of year and just sort of look at the principles of the shawarma and then take some of your classic flavors and substitute them in there, which would be really cool. Oh my gosh, that sounds so delectable. You've done it to me again. You've done it to me again with the Avengers, no less. You've done it to me once again. But there's a lot of great things to talk about when it comes to delicious meals along with great pop culture. I know something that you and I have talked about only in, in a little bit as far as not as much as Marvel or not as much as Star Wars. I want to get into a little bit about what DC is headed and although it's a little bit convoluted from time to time, there is some success stories when it comes to the DC universe. I know one of the things that I'm sure you liked and appreciated was Aquaman when it came out late last year. Shazam, uh, I don't know about Shazam because unfortunately did not meet the worldwide audience that I think a lot of people were hoping for because it looked really cool on the surface. Unfortunately, my time watching Shazam was not all that pleasant, but I know for some people it was. Uh, your thoughts on where the DC Universe stands going into the Joker movie later this year, Wonder Woman 84 next year, that they're already starting to promote. I was at some recent uh, expos that I saw some heavy promotional 
Wonder Woman 1984 uh, already promotion started already on it. Birds of Prey on all that coming out. But what are your thoughts on the DC Universe and where it stands for you right now, now that the Marvel Cinematic Universe is on kind of a little bit of a lull after Spider-Man Far From Home? Yeah, that's it's really interesting. It's kind of like um, Marvel had this massive success with their with their universe, and DC went, "Oh, we, we're going to do that," and it just it just didn't work. Um, I'm afraid I'm in the I'm in the camp of of anti Batman versus Superman. Um, I didn't enjoy that. I didn't enjoy Justice League. I have no, you're not you're not alone, my friend. Justice League I thought was okay. Although I get slammed by that for even thinking that it was anywhere near positive, I said it was okay, and I'm talking about five or six out of ten. So, but yeah, that'd be bad for me too. Yeah, yeah. BVS was just awful, awful viewing. I've I've read that uh, that oh you you got to go back and watch the director's cut, and I just can't get through the first twenty minutes. Just like trying to watch it the second time, I just. I just can't get there. Um, So I think on the one hand, it's a good idea that they've kind of abandoned this idea of a, of a massive expanded universe and they're just going to focus on solo films. Um, But then, as you said, it's kind of muddy. It's they're they're still going to do Wonder Woman 1984 and she's part of that expanded universe. And I can't see after the massive success of Aquaman, I can't see him not getting a two or three, uh, a, a second or third movie. Um, now the Joker is going to be really interesting, I think, because um, Joaquin Phoenix is just a phenomenal actor. He's one of my favorite actors to watch, and to see him sort of portray the everyman, sort of crumbling and be and turning into a monster is going to be um, that's going to be pretty phenomenal, I think. Uh, hopefully it will be a, a different turn, but I don't know how much of a turn can be after we've seen some great performances from Jack Nicholson and Heath Ledger. Yeah, well, let's not talk about the other one, um, <laughs> uh, Jared Leto. I think he probably would have done a good job if they'd handled it better. Or they given him any writing for it. Yeah. Okay, so he was really barely on, on the screen at all, and and – He's not really had any chance to shine at all, whether or prove one way or the other, I think, when it comes to Jared Leto. No, and they they really kind of mishandled that character. Well, they they mishandled all the characters in in Suicide Squad, really. But um to take such a focal character as the Joker and then give him seven minutes of screen time, you know, he's not he he's not Hannibal Lecter. He's not gonna be able to get an Academy Award for seven minutes of screen time, but people want to watch that character that that character is really magnetic and draws people in. And um, yeah, I just think that they could have done a lot more with him, but no, the, the, uh, the Joaquin Phoenix Joker, I, I think is going to be good. Um, I actually really enjoyed Shazam uh, until all the CG monsters started to, to sort of come out. Um, there were no CG monsters in it, in the, in the ads, in the trailers um, that I saw. And so I took my seven-year-old son to see it. And uh, once the like those monsters came out, they were quite scary. And um, Well, it, it was presented more as a young audience type film. And there were some scenes in there that were definitely very questionable in doing so. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And there were points in time when my son said he wanted to go home. And, and uh, he ended up just pulling the blanket over his head whenever I told him a scary part was on and then I could tell him to come back out again. But um, aside from that, like I, I thought Shazam was really good. Um, I thought that the, that the cheeky little uh, after credits Superman sting was, uh, was pretty clever given what was happening at the time the film was released. Um, so I, I wouldn't mind seeing a little bit more Shazam to be honest. Not sure how I feel about the rock being black Adam. Um, I think everyone's just come to accept that that's inevitable by this stage because they've been talking about it for seven or eight years now. Um, but yeah, the, the the DCEU. I mean, I mean, it's it's not an EU anymore. I I don't know what you'd call it now. A DCCM collection of movies or something. I don't know. It's kind of frustrating. I know if you're trying to follow it with with so many bad movies, but there is light at somewhat light at the end of the tunnel when it comes to what we saw with Aquaman. Hopefully, Wonder Woman. 
84 will be just as good as its predecessor. And you said, even though it is not going to be part of this DCEU, really, the Joker prequel is still something that could garner some acclaim for Joaquin Phoenix down the road and just basically be a performance film for all intended purposes. And then we don't know much about Birds of Prey, but hopefully that will go ahead and be much better outing than comparable films like Suicide Squad or anything of that nature. So let's hope that comes to fruition as far as some good vibes towards the DCEU or whatever you want to call it, like I, like you said, at some point in time. So I'm, I'm just like, it's out there. The Zachary Levi, as far as his performance as Shazam, I think was great. I think him it being in that role was, was just truly exceptional. I just think everything around him absolutely stunk especially the high school scenes were so contrived. Okay, if you and I had gone to high school or any what whatever that school that takes care of what from first graders to high schoolers. I mean that 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 in itself there's not too many of those that are that large in that area of the country that actually cater to all those grades. You usually have to go to different schools, but I digress. To me that got me out sorry right away. But if you and I we're actually, uh, you know, part of the school. We're actually students, and we could park right in front where nobody else could park. That uh, that scene with the truck right there. That that just that that those type of things that get me out of the context of everything. I I know it's very small and minute when it comes to it, but when you when you're talking about a story that also has some issues with, um, uh, you know, Mark Strong's character, I don't think was represented very well. I don't think. Uh, certain aspects of the familial part of it were represented very well either. I just thought it was basically Zachary Levi. He's doing his shtick and just let him be and do and trying to get through the movie. And, he, it, you know, he did the best he could. I think he has a lot of potential down the road, but I think there's so much more work to do if you want to go ahead and bring out a Shazam too. And I don't even know if that's going to be the case. I think if he's ever going to be put back into the mix, he's going to be put back into the mix within a, Justice League 2 or a Black Adam like you're talking about because The Rock is so much more well-known. And Zachary Levi is not a household name and was not a household name going into the film. So I thought that was part of the movie's problems. Just unfortunately, even though it had a, a very cool vibe going into the into the film, I think it just was not able to portray that out to a vast movie audience. Just talking about Shazam 2, do you reckon that all the other family members had their powers permanently? Like, are we going to see a, uh, the, so like, are we going to see a Shazam family now? Or I think gonna... so. I mean, cause in the comic books, I thought that was the case. Yeah. I, I just didn't know. Like if they were going to retcon that and just make the focus solely back on Shazam or not, I'd, I'd, I thought that was curious, but what I want to ask you is how do you feel about the sparkly vampire becoming the Batman? uh actually we did an episode on this about a, uh, a few weeks back basically uh, when you when your title of your episode is who is batman again that tells <laughs> you right there that uh for i don't know i be honest with you uh, obviously he's going to revamp his character and try to do what he can to disassociate himself from his past and robert pattinson trying to go ahead and become someone else is either going to work very well and people are going to be very surprised or it's going to be a train wreck. And I think you guys uh, you know, out there know me. Sometimes I like to go ahead and watch the, uh, you know, the wreck as you drive on by. Glad you're not part <laughs> of it, but you know, you want to at least go ahead and check it out. And I don't know. I just don't think it was a great move. I think there were probably many other candidates. I don't know if Nicholas Holt who plays beast in the X-Men movies was the greatest idea in the world either. I just think, to me, I, I wasn't actually not sold on the bad fleck. I thought the bad fleck, even given the proper context and the fact that if he could get himself out of rehab, would have probably been the best choice to go and continue that realm because I like some continuity within my pictures. Now that I've been weaned on the Marvel Cinematic Universe, I was hopeful that they could go ahead and make better pictures because I don't think the problem is the fact that they have a connected universe. I think the problem is that they have just poor writing and poor directing when it comes to the films in the DC movie universe. I think as long as your films are good, the part that it makes it connected makes you even more involved. And we've seen that with Avengers Endgame, the result when you try to 
go ahead and you have 10 years of connecting films together, you, you have that payoff. You have the number two film all the time be, of all time because you have them all connected with each other. And the same goes for the DC universe. You could have connected, continued to connect it all these to, uh, to each other. And in fact, in, even though you did announce it in the after credits, you still mentioned it in Aquaman. It's still somewhat loosely there. I kind of like the fact that you're going to, you know, if you go ahead and still try to connect these films together, you just have to make them good. You just have to make sure that you go ahead and put out a product that's worth watching. Even the the Captain Marvel and some other movies in the Marvel Cinematic Universe of recent note that might have not gotten the greatest reviews are still good enough and are still you know uh, enough watchable enough that that are really good to get through and that are still able to go ahead and tie in over, into the overall narrative. And I think that in doing so, in going to Robert Pattinson. And going to a character and an individual that I think a lot of people have great questions on whether he can pull off a young Batman in a detective type the Batman scenario, that to me is is very that's a big gamble. You had mentioned the, the word big gamble before, and this to me is a big gamble. This is bigger than anything that Marvel's actually doing right now with the Eternals. I think that's a safer bet. I mean, I'm here in Vegas. If you ask me which is a bigger bet. Robert Pattinson as the Batman or the Eternals, I'm betting on Robert Pattinson as the longer shot to go ahead and be successful long term. Yeah. Yeah. There was just so many things there that I just didn't um I just I can't imagine it. Now I I really couldn't imagine um uh Ben Affleck as Batman either when that was first announced, but uh you know, he he certainly embodied the uh certain versions of the character. So um, you know, the, the huge Batman, you know, the, not just a guy in a suit, but like a tank of a man in a suit who just bashes thugs. So he, like he was, he, he was that version of a Batman. Now, one of the things is I just don't see it physically in, um, in, in Robert Pattinson. I mean, obviously the guy's going to have to bulk up, but he doesn't have the, the record of say, um, uh, mental blank Batman from the Nolan films. Oh, you're talking about Christian Bale. Cause Christian, yes, Christian Bale, Bale came out of the feel like American psycho and whatnot. Yeah. He, he doesn't have the, the track record of Christian Bale of going through these massive body transformations for each film that he does. Um, and I mean, you know, if they, if they do any Batman shirtless scenes, how they're going to handle all that sparkling off his chest and his stomach. I, just... I knew you were going to, you beat me to the punch on the sparkle, my friend. Oh, did I steal your punchline? I'm sorry. No, no, I was gonna say there's there's I wonder how much sparkle was gonna be there as far as to you know get that juice going as far as that's concerned. So, you know, put that sparkle <laughs> on in the uh in those uh thick shakes that they're gonna have to go ahead and you know, those thousand calorie shakes and all that, plus uh, you know, maybe uh using a little bit of steroids or whatnot, because I don't think he's getting tested if that's the case. But you're right, you're right. Something has to be done as far as him bulking up to be more presentable as a Batman. When you're fighting off crime, you can't just go ahead and give them a glance and a look like you can a moody look like you did for so many episodes for so many movies already in the Twilight series. You can't just give them a look like you could back then. When you're talking about the Joker, or the Riddler, or whoever you're going to go ahead and face off off as. So I don't know. It's, it's going to be a very touchy situation. But when you're watching the DC Universe. And you, you know, you mentioned you had some some good cobblers that you made recently, and you had a great recipe that you you know you spoke to me about. I think cobblers are not a bad deal as far as what you would like to go ahead and create when it comes to watching or enjoying any movie that you can, i.e., probably not very many of them, but let's say Wonder Woman or Aquaman. Let's say you're watching that, or for your in your case, Shazam as well. So you're saying you're watching Shazam and you, you're interested in in dining on a good cobbler because you mentioned before that you had a great cobbler recipe that you wanted to share with our audience. Oh yeah, yeah. I I came up with this just a few weeks ago. It's a it's a bit of an adult recipe. Um, so I I don't know that you that you'd want to give it to kids. It'd probably be okay, I suppose. Um, but it's a it it's an apple and fireball cobbler. Now, when I was over in the states, I became aware that fireball is not a particularly top shelf drink um but over here it is so 
for the 750 mil bottle over here, we pay about $65 and I think it's about nine bucks over in the States. So <laughs> it's, um, Oh my gosh. It's a, it's a bottom shelf drink where you are. And it's a, it's a high end drink over here. So, but I was thinking about um, making a cobbler and we don't have an abundance of blackberries over here. It's, it's kind of hard to be able to go and buy as many blackberries as you need to be able to make a whole pie. So I decided, okay, I'm going to make an apple cobbler because we've got tons of apples. What goes well with apple? Cinnamon. What's got cinnamon in it? In it? Fireball. So I, I mixed up this, uh, this apple kind of apple pie mix, brown sugar, um, the apples, obviously, a little bit of salt, a few other things, and, uh, and about a cup of fireball. And I was product testing a new barbecue that was sent to me by PK Grills. And I thought, well, I'm, I'm going to uh, test out their claim that this is a grill and a smoker. And so I set, I set out about the day and I, I smoked up some beef ribs earlier in the day. And then while they were resting, I cranked the temperature back up to 350 Fahrenheit and slipped this cobbler in with, and with the kind of cake mix sort of drizzled across the top and uh, cooked that at 350 for about 45 minutes, turning it halfway through just to make sure that it cooks evenly because the way that cooker works, you've it's it's not a heat underneath and the food on top. It's a heat to the side and a food on the other side. So you want to make sure you rotate that that pie to make sure it cooks evenly. And it was really good the first day. It was phenomenal the second day. Once it, the uh, once all the ingredients had had time to sort of sit and settle in the fridge and that, that liqueur had infused everything and, oh, man, it was so good. So, so good. Oh, my gosh. You're... you're... Troubling me even more, my friend, with all these great recipe ideas. Oh, I tell you what, that's just uh, looking at a fireball right now as far as that's concerned in my near future, if that's the case. But may want to avoid hitting the kids right now as far as with those. Let them grow up to be uh, 18 or 21 drinking age first, I think, on that. Or is it that potent? I don't know when it finally comes out. Well, it's you, you, you're only using it for flavor. So it's, it's maybe a cup of fireball in a whole pie. So it's, oh, not, okay. it's not a huge amount no, and, it's, and it's, alcohol does cook out, but I'm just saying to be careful because I haven't actually tested it. So no. I, I can't say for sure how much alcohol is going to be left in it at, by the end, but alcohol does cook out. And as I said, if you're talking about, you know, parts per million and all that sort of stuff, you, you know, you're not sitting, de- sitting them down with a cup of fireball and a straw and saying, there you are, son, have that. Yeah. You're uh, you're dispersing it through an entire pie and then cooking it. So it's like rum candy or anything of that nature that that people actually you know you put a very small amount in just to have the flavor, like you said. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. All right, yeah. So that's good. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Just make it sure. Just make it sure. You want to go ahead and and not be uh, on the wrong end of a uh, you know somebody saying, "Hey, hey, I got my kid. He got arrested for DUI. You know, hey, he's only 12. You know, by you know, he ate those apple. He ate those cobblers. So, no, I'm just kidding. Oh, there, there, there's two problems with that. One, he ate the cobbler, and two, what's a 12 year old doing driving? <laughs> you never know, my friend. Once somebody gets started on your your delicious apple cobblers, I'm kidding, of course. <laughs> it does sound delectable, indeed. Once again, I'm on with my good friend Ben Arnaud from the Smoking Hot Confessions podcast and also SmokingHotConfessions.com. you got to check out all the great stuff that's going on today in his world, Smoking Hot Confessions. One last thing before I have you talk more about Smoking Hot Confessions, and that is Star Wars Episode Nine, my friend. That is coming up around the corner. Before you know it, we'll be, we'll be ending the Skywalker saga as far as what what they're saying anyways because they want to go ahead on to new trilogies by the writers from the game of thrones and also rian johnson and get on with that plus also have you watch disney plus as well but your thoughts on star wars episode 9 jj abrams getting back onto the, the director's chair trying to see as far as i guess try and create something that maybe will be a safe ending. I don't see anything really outreaching. I see him going ahead and after the experience known as the last Jedi, which was so polarizing to so many people and you know this, and I can see your expression already that it was so polarizing for a lot of people out there. People love it or hate it. And it it just, I think that Disney and Lucasfilm wanted to go ahead and have something safe. And just like he did in the first film, not try to go way overboard on trying to create new Star Wars lore, but just trying to go ahead and, and take what 
was good about the Star Wars narrative and just make it safe enough for audiences to go ahead and appreciate. I thought the first Star Wars, as far as the reboot is concerned, was okay. Uh, after all was said and done with The Last Jedi, I thought, okay, there were some highs and there were some lows that were just all over the place when it comes to The Last Jedi. But your thoughts on where we're heading to when it comes to Episode Nine and your excitement for the Star Wars saga as far as the Skywalker saga finally coming to an end. Yeah, there were de- there were definitely some some really good points about The Last Jedi that I'd like to see uh, explored. So this concept of um, of Luke Skywalker being able to uh, not teleport, but um, like remote view himself across the universe like that that sort of thing i thought was, was really fascinating um visually i love that fight scene on crate where each time they sort of move their feet they're breaking through that salt crust and that brilliant red color is underneath um so i i, I thought visually that was just spectacular um in terms of the new one kylo ren has to keep his shirt on um not interested in any more of that. <laughs> that that was just awkward the not like i'm not trying to you know bash the guy for you know how he looks at all that's not what i'm saying but just the scene was awkward well and i think like, and i think daisy really played that off perfectly as being awkward yeah yeah but i i felt like hang on are they like what is this connection supposed to be uh, it, it is this turning into a forbidden romance type thing or like, what is, what is happening here? And uh, exactly. yeah, I just, I, yeah, that sort of really left field ambiguity sort of threw me off a bit. Um, I could have done without the entire casino sequence. You and I both, you and I both. The whole thing, riding those funny racehorse looking things. Um, yeah. I could have done without that whole thing. So coming into the new one, um, I'm addicted at the moment to watching all these daily Star Wars theory videos. And uh, there seems to be a new one every day. And then 16 people will make a video about that that new theory every day. Um, as much as the child in me would like to see Luke resurrected, I don't think we're going to see him resurrected. I think we're going to see him as a force ghost and like a, like a mentor type thing sort of in in continuation with the canon but the fact that palpatine's going to be in it means that they are going to be crossing those borders of resurrection or something like that which i think is going to be is going to be interesting because if we there's a lot of sort of christian parallels in these stories and if you're going to have the bad guy resurrected then you've got to have the good guy resurrected as well because you know you can't just have the main hero, Luke Skywalker, sort of whispering from a cloud. Try this. Try that. No, you can't. No, you like, can't. You know, you gotta if you're gonna have the big bad come back, you gotta have the big good come back as well. So I think that I think that's gonna be interesting. I'm excited that JJ's back. Um, I think he probably had a had an overall vision for what he wanted to do from the start. And some of the criticism for um the first one of the new trilogy, The Force Awakens. Was that it retreads all the old stuff? Um, well, like that's why I said it was safe. That's why I said he was treading on safe water because he he went about it in a in what I define as a safe fashion because he did tread on a lot of already tried and true type uh, themes and narratives that was already created within the Star Wars universe. And yeah, I don't think that was a bad idea, and it proved not to be because it garnered over two billion dollars. You can't argue with that. No, 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 no he's got to sort of balance tapping into the nostalgia of the people in our age group who grew up with the original star Wars and also meeting the merchandise requirements of attracting all new kids to it, to go and buy all the toys and stuff. So yeah, I, um, I think he's going to be the one to do it though. If, if, uh, if Rian Johnson was coming back again, I, I don't know. I'd, I'd be a bit skeptical. Um, I'm interested to see what he does though with his own standalone trilogy when he's able to just, you know, take and mold his own story that's, that's unrelated to the Skywalker series and what we already know and love. I think that's going to be interesting because as I said, there were some really nice 
visual elements of the of the Last Jedi. There were some nice story beats in there at times. Um, I guess we sort of can't talk about the the next Star Wars movie and not talk about um, Carrie though. Yeah, so, how are they going to go ahead and explain that? And we know we've seen or we've heard that there's some used, uh, not used footage from Star Wars The Force Awakens that will be part of it, that will be integrated within the confines of Star Wars Episode Nine. Yeah, I think that's going to be interesting as well. Um, I have read that they're doing a nice scene with her and her daughter who plays a the, she's now a general or something I think I read. Yeah, she's, um, a, she's a resistance, but you're right. She, she does move up and rank it. She did, uh, you know, she's she's become a claimed actress on her own. She was recently in Booksmart. I mean, that's something that a lot of people need to go out of the way to see. Is she's really garnered some acclaim. So I, I'm looking forward to good things as far as her character is concerned. Yeah, yeah, I, I quite liked her in uh, in American Horror Story as well. She's done, um, she's played quite a few different roles in that now. Um, which just as a TV show, I just think that that's brilliant. Um, I, I studied theater in my first university degree and that whole idea of a troupe of actors and okay, we're going to put on this show and then everybody shuffles character and we're going to put on the next show. And then it's very old school sort of traditional approach to, to theater and that they're taking that to television. But anyway, we're, I'm, I'm down the rabbit hole. I'm on a sidetrack here. Um, yeah, I, I think it's going to be very interesting what they do with, with Carrie, um, the, the, the whole Carrie Poppins thing I thought was a little bit left field. She gets sucked out into space and then, oh, she's actually using the force. Well, that was a narrative, as I've said before, that they could have used to, I don't want to say write her out because she had already passed away by the time that movie came out. And it would have been probably in their best interest to go ahead and maybe at that point in time, narratively, they, there was an out there and they chose not to take it. And I, I'm, I'm pretty sad that they did because the fact that they're now going to try and put themselves in a pickle and trying to get themselves out of it by finding unused footage, by having to do all this CGI and all that. So it, it, to me, they had themselves an out and didn't take it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's, they've kind of painted themselves into a corner a little bit with her. Um, but that said, you know, if we get to see Carrie pick up a lightsaber and start chopping some stormtroopers, that'd be pretty cool too. That was what we were hoping for. I know a lot of people were as well. And hopefully one day she'll get the respect from Disney. That I think she feels uh, that I think we, we think that uh, she deserves like, you know, become a Disney princess. My gosh, she probably makes you more as a princess still to this day than still any of, you know, almost any of those uh, princesses that are out there for Disney. So, you know, like, come on, make her official Disney princess. It wouldn't kill you. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, 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 the whole concept of the Disney princess is coming under fire a bit lately too. I took my son to see Wreck-It Ralph too. And uh, they really sort of roasted the, uh, the, the concept of the Disney princess in that film. I thought that was quite interesting given the current political climate. Exactly, exactly. But yes, uh, there's a lot of great things to talk about, my friend. And last but not least, are you expecting when it comes to Star Wars Episode Nine something really cataclysmic or, or just a nice, uh, I don't want to say a soft or a slow closure to the series, just something that fans can truly be proud of? Your, JJ is going to be helming it, so there is probably going to be some type of you know, a happy ending. I think that's going to be constructed that will try to please most of the Star Wars fans because you can't please all of them. But do you expect overall that Star Wars episode nine is going to end up on a good note? Um, I think it's going to be bittersweet. Um, I, I, I don't think he's going to be able to tie it up in a nice bow and we all get the warm, fuzzy feelings walking out of the cinema. Um, I think that there's going to have to be a uh, tragedy balanced with victory um in that film i think we're going to have to uh maybe chewbacca is going to buy it this time i don't know like i i think we're going to see some uh yeah it'll be tra it, it'll be tragedy balanced with victory i think i think you got to put the millennium falcon in there as well oh you reckon he's going to blow up the millennium falcon 
I think you have to. I think at this point, I think it's, I love the Millennium Falcon, but it, it, it would feel real out of place if it showed up on somebody else's uh, trilogy or any other part of the Star Wars universe, you know, uh, say let's flash forward 50, 100 years later, because we've already done that in Star Wars The Force Awakens, where it was sitting basically in dust and mothballs and then revived. So why do that again? So, I mean, at this point in time, I mean, if if there's anything that's going to go ahead and, and as far as an icon from the Star Wars universe, Chewbacca could be one, but I think the Millennium Falcon could be another. Ooh, yeah. If you had to choose, which one would you prefer to see gone? I wouldn't say I want to prefer to see gone, but I think the best narratively, because I like to think in that scope, would probably be the Millennium Falcon. Oh, I think there may be some point where they may have to detonate it or destroy it for some reason, and there will be this long moment of of silence or you know with the music or whatever, just and it's bloom like that. Or it could be something where it's just inoperable to the point where it needs to be destroyed. But I just think it it of the two, I think Chewbacca being killed off would probably be, I don't know the the harder move to make. Mm. Yeah. True. Interesting interesting but they can always make solo two and three to uh to continue the chewbacca character so yeah uh, i don't think that's happening anytime. <laughs> <laughs> but again i'm on with my good friend it is ben arno from the smoking hot confessions podcast you got to check out his awesome podcast today before i go in and where tell everybody where your podcast is at as far as where they can find it and your awesome site as well I need to hear it from you, my friend, and they need to hear as far as our audience is concerned. Why do you want to hit up the star? Why do you want to go ahead and be a part of the Smoking Hot Confessions experience? Well, I, I try and take a, a really unique experience on the whole barbecue scene. So um, I don't just do recipes. Um, I have a podcast show of my own, the Smoking Hot Confessions podcast, where I interview different people involved in the in the wider barbecue scene so i'll i'll talk to competitors about how they do what they do i'll talk to uh rub manufacturers smoker manufacturers um event promoters event organizers all that sort of thing um so i, I try and get a take on the on the industry as a whole and i put all that into smokinghotconfessions.com so um all that stuff is there we've just recently released a line of uh just killer merch so we've got some uh, some really interesting caps and T-shirts and uh, insulated tumblers to keep your cold drinks cold and your hot drinks hot, all that sort of stuff. Um, so by all means, check all that out as well. Uh, we've got a couple of eBooks on there. If you're into competition barbecue or if you love bacon, there's an eBook there for, uh, as well for you. Uh, how to make bacon at home and then what to do with it. Um, some recipes and whatnot. So there's loads of good stuff there. Uh, we're all over the socials, YouTube channels, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, you'll find us everywhere. Just do a search for Smoking Hot Confessions. And one of the things that I do, particularly on um, on YouTube and Facebook, and now that Instagram has IGTV, now I'm doing it on Instagram as well, is I do run around Australia and around the United States doing um, video interviews. So short short snippets at at competitions, at festivals. And so there's a there's a visual element to it now as well. You actually get to uh, to hear from some of the champions in the game themselves, which is quite fun. So for a detailed look at the entire barbecue industry as a whole, competition, food, the devices that you need to go ahead and make it, the inside on rubs on, on and all that, the best place to go is the Smoking Hot Confessions podcast. Check it out today on Apple Podcasts and over 30 different podcast outlets. And of course, his awesome site, his eBooks too, and that is smokinghotconfessions.com. Well, my friend, I'll tell you what, it's been awesome talking pop culture with you as always. I want to check in with you from time to time as well, not only on great recipes, because I got a lot more great recipes coming later this summer I'd like to throw at you, or some great ideas I want to hear from you when it comes to some steaks. Uh, I, I, I was thinking about you the other day, man, when we were going, I was going through Costco and I was seeing all those steaks. I'm like, hmm. I wonder how Ben would grill each and every one of these steaks. I wonder how. But uh, yes, as far as some great steak ideas, maybe some also as well, going back into shish kebabs or, or some other things that you like to go ahead when it comes to grilling 
and everything like you go ahead as far as all your great ideas and everything you like to go ahead and and put on the grill i just anytime you you stop by when you're whether it's pop culture or cooking i just love to hear your thoughts my friend anytime mate anytime i love being part of the show and i love the fact that uh that that you love to talk food as well as uh comics and movies and tv shows because i'm exactly the same so uh i always look forward to it every time you reach out to me and uh and ask me if you like if i've uh if i'd like to be on the show so well i love talking about it but the problem is my scale loves to tell me that i love talking about it and experiencing it way too much when i talk about cooking and pop culture but you know what it's all worth it it's all worth it indeed because the delicious the delicious delicious recipes that you always provide us on the show and all the great things at the smoking hot confessions it's definitely worth it my friend i'll tell you what it's just awesome having you on the show and being part of the pop culture cosmos.